video. So how, if it wasn't started yet, how were people seeing this already? Oh, that's because we are in webinar, but we're also pushing it to Facebook and YouTube. Ah, okay. So more people can watch. <laughs> so we are live on all of our channels. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday. My name is Gina Veramo. I'm the outreach manager for Nova, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon's virtual field trip. This is the third series inspired by our newest chemistry series, Beyond the Elements, which is a three-part look into the fascinating chemistry that makes our world and everything in it. So over the last few months, we've explored the world of DNA extraction and the science of molten glass. And we've learned that transformative chemical reactions are happening around us all of the time. Every solid liquid or gas in the world, as we know it, begins with reactions between individual atoms and molecules. And during today's field trip, we're going to zoom in on the periodic table and focus on the elements that make our world possible. And we are lucky to have an extraordinary guest to guide us through the elements and around his homemade periodic table table. Uh, Teo Gray is with us. He's an award-winning author of the elements, molecules, and reactions. And he was featured in Nova's Hunting the Elements. And we're thrilled that he chose to join us again for Beyond the Elements Reactions. So if you have any questions for him over the course of our time together, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, make sure you put them in the chat in the comments. If you're with us on Zoom, make sure you put them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so without further ado, thanks for taking the time to join us this afternoon. What are we looking at? Well, um, <clears throat> so you're looking at, uh, I'm gonna give you like a better view of this in a minute, but I thought I would sort of start off by explaining um, how, how did my office end up being this way? Um, I mean, just to give you a quick scan. So that's all elements. This thing is full of elements. This, wait, I can flip my, uh, I can flip my camera. There we go. So these cabinets are all full of elements. This is a cubicle. I mean, you walk around it, it's all cabinets, right? It's cabinets here, it's cabinets all the way around. Uh, there is no door to get in here, except in sort of Narnia style, this cabinet is actually the door. Um, and inside of here, it's more elements. All these shelves are full full of more elements. There's, this is the nickel shelf here, actually two nickel shelves. They're roughly in atomic number order from the lightest over to the heaviest. Uh, there's like an unreasonable amount of elements in this room. Um, so I thought I'd start by explaining, how did that happen? Uh, so the answer is that this, this building that we're in, this is the Wolfram Research Headquarters building in Champaign, Illinois. Um, and many years ago, uh, we were in a different building. Actually, can we see the other building from here? Not quite. Um, we were in a different building in Champaign and we moved into this building. And then at some point, my department, which is the user interface department on account of I'm the original author of the, the notebook interface for Mathematica. Um, we moved into this space and we didn't have a table. We thought we would make this like as a conference room area and we needed a conference table and we didn't have one. And uh, uh, you know, I looked through office supply catalogs and it was kind of boring and expensive and like these are ugly tables. Uh, and at the same time, I was reading a book. Um, uh, let me flip back here. At the same time, I was reading a book called Uncle Tungsten by Oliver Sacks, which is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And he talks about a periodic table in the Kensington Science Museum in London. Um, and I thought he was saying that they had a table, like a periodic table that had element samples on it. And I thought this was like a brilliant idea. I, why had nobody done this before? And then like you read the next sentence down in the book and you realize it's actually just on the wall and there are samples on it, but they're like on shelves on the wall. And it's just like any other periodic table display that the number of, you know, many science museums have these things and they're all on the wall. None of them are actually tables. And this, this seemed to me like just a tremendous wasted opportunity to make a periodic table table. Uh, and we needed a table. And so I thought, well, you know, 
d d now is the time for somebody to make a periodic table table. And so I built this thing, um, which is a periodic table table. So it's a table and we did, we had, we had one meeting at it. Like there's a picture which ended up being published in USA Today for some reason uh, of like eight people surrounding this table um, having a meeting. And that was the last time we ever had a meeting there because very little got done because everybody was playing with the table and somebody dropped, it's actually the, the uh, John Fultz was his name. Uh, he dropped this chunk of silicon and broke a key on his laptop. Um, so that was the last meeting we had at this table. Um, but so once I had built the table, for various practical reasons, uh, the lettering on these tiles, it's engraved. There's a, I used a manual pantograph engraving machine where you sort of lay out letter templates and then run like a little miniature router to engrave these letters. Um, I could only do fairly small pieces of wood at a time. And I was originally thinking of gluing them together, but then I thought maybe instead of gluing them together, I will uh, leave them loose and then actually have a compartment underneath. So any of these tiles, you can push the bottom right corner like that and it pops up and then you can lift it up. And underneath there are samples. So this is the lead tile. And so these are my various pieces of lead. So these are uh, this is a big chunk of lead, which I've varnished. So it's sort of okay to touch. Um, lead bullets actual lead bullets. Um, yeah, it reminds me, I wonder, is the silver bullet still here? So if we go and find silver. Um, yeah, okay, so I made, I made these, these lead bullets. I made a bunch of these, I have a bullet mold. And I thought I would see if I could make a silver bullet, just, you know, in case of werewolf infestation or something. So this is, this is an actual silver bullet. It's also, it's got silver foil on it. Um, so anyway, I had these compartments, uh, you know, and, and once you have a periodic table that's got compartments, obviously there is a very strong pull, Let's see if I can get the lead back in, uh, there's a very strong sort of temptation to start filling them up with samples of elements. Um, so that's what I did, and I discovered that eBay, eBay was relatively new at the time, it was pretty well established, but uh, it turned out to be a excellent source of elements. Like I thought, I thought it would take me decades to find examples of all the actual elements, but it actually was really just a few months to get a pretty good set of everything. Uh, and of course, um, not all of them fit underneath the little compartments. And at first, I was um, I went to some effort to get everything to fit. So, for example, this tungsten. Now here is where Here's would be nice if you guys were actually here because it would then be a lot more impressive when I do that. Um, so this, this thing, it weighs 11 pounds, which I don't know if that sounds like a, not a, a lot or not, but for an object this size to weigh 11 pounds, it's, it's, it's very surprising. Um, it, tungsten, if you look at the tile here, so the density of tungsten is 19.3 that compares, for example, with lead is only 11 grams per cubic centimeter. So this thing is you know, almost twice as dense as lead and lead is pretty heavy. And something like iron, that's only you know, 7.8. So tungsten is very, very dense. Uh, and, and that's why I have a bunch of you know, pieces of tungsten. Like, and this thing is, you see there's a spring in the bottom because otherwise when you dropped it in, it would just go right through and break out the bottom of the table. Oh, wow. uh, and most people, even, you know, full grown adults are not able to lift this thing out. Uh, and I just realized doing it now, like I practiced the amount of force it takes to be able to lift it out with two fingers and I can barely do it now. I'm, I guess I'm older now, but I used to be able to lift this thing out. Uh, like I trained my fingers to be able to pick it up. It's, anyway, like that's one you kind of had, had to be there. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so then as I started accumulating 
more and more objects, they just were not fitting. And so I got display cases uh, like this one. So that's all full of elements now, and that's full of elements. And then I showed you inside here, but so inside there's all full of elements. And actually over here, there's drawers full of even more elements. These are the ones that are kind of either more delicate or less attractive. And they're all organized by atomic number. And basically pretty much every single thing that you can see in my book, The Elements, which I assume a number of you have seen, um, they're all here somewhere. And in fact, if any of you want to particularly see, a, like you have a favorite uh, thing that you saw in my book, if you can get the attention um, of the moderator there, uh, of Gina, then uh, I would be happy to try to find it for you. And we do have a few here. requests. Okay, requests, great. Um, people are very interested to see uh, the gold compartment. <laughs> the gold compartment, aha, uh -huh. okay, well, so there's two answers to that. So gold is here. Now, if you open it up, um, so this looks pretty impressive. That's a fairly substantial amount of gold. That would be worth many, many thousands of dollars. However, it is fake. It's actually, and it's starting to peel now, it's actually gold-plated tungsten. And apparently not a very good job of plating. And the reason it's gold-plated tungsten is because if you look, remember the density of tungsten, 19.3, density of gold, 19.3. So they are extremely close in density. And you know, anybody who knows anything about gold will know that you know, it, it's characteristic of gold that is very heavy. And you know, if you just have a small piece of jewelry or something, it, you, know, you don't necessarily notice it, but as soon as you have any substantial amount of gold, um, you notice the density of it. And you would immediately notice if you had you know, fake gold, if it was just made of lead or something, it wouldn't be heavy enough. So, credible fake gold, uh, it really needs to be made of, of tungsten. There's nothing else. I mean, you could make it out of, let's say, iridium or osmium, but they're actually more expensive than gold. You could make it out of uranium, uh, but that's radioactive. So, you know, there's, really, there's only two good candidates that are cheaper than gold, and those are tungsten and uranium, and up to, you know, that one's radioactive. So, so everyone uses tungsten, and, and tungsten fake gold is a real thing. I mean, there are there are you know, plenty of examples in the world where um, supposed bars of gold have been found to actually have tungsten cores inside um, because that makes for a pretty good fake gold. So I have this fake gold. Uh, this, this is real gold, it's just gold foil. And I don't actually know if this is real or not, to be perfectly honest. It feels heavy, it might be, but I think it's probably gold plated. Um, the actual gold, of which there are several examples in the book is in the safe and anticipating this question i already put the combination in so i wouldn't have to mess around with the combination <laughs> um so i can just open it and then we see the various um more valuable things uh, in the back are, these are antimony goblets, um, famous for poisoning people who drink out of them. So we don't do that. Um, and then a bottle of wine, which is not in any way special, except if you put it inside a safe, it makes it seem really special. So it's there. And then these are some 10 ounce bars of silver. Silver is also quite dense, but not nearly as dense as gold. Um, this is a chunk of rhenium, which depending on I don't know, actually, I haven't looked it up recently. There, at various times in the past, this has been worth a fortune uh, because the price of rhenium, uh, it goes up and down a lot. And I'm not sure what it's worth right now. I haven't looked it up recently. Um, but here, getting back to gold. So let me just take this whole drawer out. So this is the, well, most of it is real here. Um, this is, this is um, my biggest piece of gold. So it's three and a half ounces, roughly, um, of actual gold. You can see, I don't know if you can see in the camera or not, but it's, it's very, it's like dented. 
and I could put a new dent in it. So, you know, pure 24 karat gold is very soft, very easily scratched. Um, and here's uh, this one ounce. I used to have this on a chain, um, actually in the compartment, but I decided that was not really good enough once the price got too high. Uh, an ounce of platinum. Uh, this is one of my favorite samples. So this is um, the coin, which is uh, on my, oops, it's in the poster as this representative of silver. And it's also the main picture in the elements book representing silver. And so this coin, this coin was older in the year zero than the United States is today, for example. It's something like 2,300 years old. Um, and it cost less to buy this coin than it would have cost to license a photograph of it from a stock photo library. So I bought the coin and took a picture of it because that was cheaper, which it seems remarkable to me. I mean, you know, how many 2,300 year old things could you buy? Uh, and the answer is they're a dime a dozen. Well, not quite. I mean, it was a, it was a couple hundred dollars or something because uh, it's a reasonably nice one, but nobody ever throws coins away. There's so many coins, including extremely ancient coins, and people keep finding, you know, out in a farm field somewhere, they'll dig up a bag full of, you know, old Roman coins. Um, so they're actually really not that uncommon. Uh, I got a few others that are smaller. Um, this is a really nice piece of niobium. That's the main sample in the book and poster. Uh, this is the one thing in this drawer which is fake. So this is a, a an ancient type of Chinese coin um, called sort of a boat corner. It has a Chinese name that I can't pronounce. Um, and I knew it was fake because I bought it for less than its melt value as silver. It's supposed to be silver, but it's really just tin. Um, and it's a it's a fake. Uh, and and one of the reasons you can tell it's a fake is because they accidentally use I forget which one. Uh, if anybody reads Chinese here, um, one of the characters, they accidentally used the modern simplified Chinese character instead of the traditional Chinese character, which is kind of a giveaway for what's supposed to be an ancient coin. Um, but, you know, I knew it was a fake and I, I think sometimes fakes are, are more interesting than the real thing in some ways. Uh, this uh, somewhat unassuming looking thing, uh, it's got a, Let's see, can I pull it out? Yeah, so it has a, like a mesh inside. So this is all 100% pure platinum um, and worth quite a lot because it's, I don't know what it weighs, but substantial amount of platinum. And the reason a thing like this exists is because platinum is commonly used in, uh, in chemical apparatus for use in, you know, highly reactive, you know, acidic solutions or various things. It's, it's a, you know, it's a metal, it's kind of like gold in that it resists attack by chemicals of all sorts. So people make, you know, like mosquito netting out of pure platinum, um, things like that. Um, so that's, uh, I don't know. Oh, this one. So the radioactive elements, they're a little bit tricky sometimes to collect. I mean, some are easier. So this is my uranium some of my uranium here, the, the Fiesta wear plates, highly radioactive. Um, that's a bar of like a pound and a half or so uh, uranium bar. Um, I've got like a 10 pound counterweight in the other cubicle, but other radioactive elements are quite difficult. Um, plutonium, for example, uh, it's actually illegal to own any amount of plutonium as a private citizen. Uranium, you can have 15 pounds of it at a time. Um, Plutonium, you can't. And the closest that I have, it probably shouldn't also, as well as can't. Um, but the closest I have is this, which is a, the empty casing from a plutonium battery from a pacemaker. So the thing that they implant in your heart to, to keep your heart going. Um, Nowadays, they, they use, you know, rechargeable batteries, and I think they charge them with a coil on the outside of your chest or something like that. But it, it, in a certain period, particularly in the Soviet Union, they use these plutonium thermoelectric batteries. 
which had, I think it says three curies of plutonium in it, just a tremendous amount. Um, and I got this on eBay. Uh, and um, it's the closest I have to actual plutonium. I've, I've been offered um, intact plutonium batteries like this by two, two different entities, a hospital and an undertaker, both of whom had, you know, gotten a hold of one of these from, some, from, from their owner who no longer needed it um, because they were about to get buried. And they, they saw that there was a radioactive warning sign on the pacemaker that they just, you know, I guess surgically extracted. Um, and they didn't know what to do with it. And they Googled this. And if you Google, you know, plutonium pacemaker battery, whatever, you very quickly find my website. And so I got these emails, you know, twice in a row, people saying, would you like to have this battery? Because we don't know what else to do with it. Um, and I, it was very difficult to resist the temptation, but I told them, sorry, you have to send it back to Los Alamos, uh, the Los Alamos National Lab, which, which is where all plutonium is supposed to go because they will love it and take care of it there and know what to do with it. We also have some so, folks that are interested in seeing carbon. Carbon, yes. Okay, well, let me put away the precious metals. <laughs> That's um, probably a good idea. So, well, when I have actual classes come here, I, um, I always pass around the gold and ask the teacher to make sure that it comes back again. <laughs> uh, but Actually, I remember when someone I asked that. They asked, um, like, are you ever nervous that you're going to get robbed because you have all this nice stuff in your office? <laughs> well, I mean, so, you know, the actual precious metals are in this safe, which normally I, you know, would be, I have a combination. And I mean, it, this is a software company. So, you know, we have security and badges and cameras everywhere. And uh, as far as I know, nothing has gone missing. Nothing that I know of that I've noticed is missing. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. If somebody were to break in here, they would probably steal all the computers rather than this weird stuff that... It's weird safe. <laughs> yeah. The safe would be hard to steal. That was, that's a very right. heavy. It's like a, I got it at an auction. Uh, it's, you know, a big old uh, fire safe, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Very heavy. Anyway, carbon. So this is yeah. my biggest carbon sample. This is uh, a chunk of coal, which is something like 85, 90% carbon. Um, the rest being hydrogen and maybe some impurities. So it's not pure carbon. It's not graphite. It's coal. And it's like, I think I paid $11 for these two big hunks of coal. Because um, there's actually a market still for mostly blacksmiths uh, buy coal from for their forges um but then some other other interesting carbon samples um oh, uh, this door is not opening nicely let's see here here we go okay so this this is a graphite mold i believe if i'm not mistaken it is uh let me take it over here where i can take it apart I think this is the mold that I made the silver bullet with because the lead, the lead bullets, they're made with an aluminum mold uh, or maybe it's a steel mold, but in any case, it wouldn't work for silver because it, it would, um, hold on. Okay. This comes apart. Hopefully we're not gonna break it. Yes, there we go. Okay, so now that I've got it apart, I can flip the camera again. Okay, so it's two-part mold, and this is this is the tool that I used to make the mold. So the first thing I did was I used a lathe to this is just a piece of steel or something like that to cut this this bullet shape, and then I milled out this section cut out to make it into essentially a cutting blade and then uh i you know use that to mill out the graphite graphite is very soft so graphite this is pure carbon basically it's 100 percent you know carbon in the form of graphite so i milled that out and then milled out the other half and with, with these pins that register it so when you put these two halves together you have a cavity in the shape of um, 
in the shape of this silver bullet, which should fit perfectly in here like that. And the reason I had to make the graphite mold is because the melting point of silver is much higher, uh, much, much higher than the melting point of lead. So if we compare it in Celsius. So 962 Celsius for silver versus uh, 327 for lead. So graphite is excellent for um, molds for casting metals because it it's, has an extremely high, it doesn't really melt it. It will eventually sublimate or something. Um, but it, you know, it can withstand incredibly high temperatures. You can cast anything, like any metal can be cast in graphite. And it's very easy to work with because it's quite soft. Um, and you can buy huge bars of it. I have these big four inch by four inch by two foot chunks of graphite that I use occasionally to make molds for things. Someone's asking, so, is that the same graphite that you would use to write with? Yes. I mean, this will write like a pencil uh, if I had a piece of paper. Um, I have no paper, but I have this package here. <laughs> so um, I don't, don't let me forget to get back to the other piece of graphite in there. Um, yeah. So this is a package. This package I keep on this table. And again, you'd like, you kind of have to be here to appreciate this package. Um, but let's see if we can write on it. Yeah, so yeah. see that. I mean, this is basically pencil lead. Um, that, I mean, I, I think actual pencil lead, it's, it's not pure graphite. It has some, it's like a powdered graphite with some kind of binders and they, depending on whether it's a, you know, a number two pencil or a, you know, a harder or softer type of pencil, they use different binders. So it's not pure graphite, but it's mostly graphite. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the thing about this package is most people, I, 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 what I do is I go on the other side of the room and say, oh, bring me that package. And they go over it and they say, it's glued to the table. Like, I mean, I, I literally, I can't make it, I can't lift it at all. Not even a bit. I'm squeezing as hard as I can. The best I can do is slide it, kind of. It's hard even to slide. And if you get it off the edge of the table, you can kind of, kind of lift it up. Um, but it weighs roughly 60 pounds. And that's a lot, you know, if you've got a sibling that weighs 60 pounds, imagine trying to lift them and then pack them into a package this size. So you probably can guess uh, what it is. It's a block of tungsten that has been machined exactly to the size of a US flat rate priority mail shipping box. Flat rate. <laughs> so even though this weighs 60 pounds, it costs 495 to ship it. <laughs> and because it's a flat, I mean, it's that, you know, they, they made the offer. Anything you can fit in this box, you can ship for four ninety five. dollars They probably didn't anticipate somebody putting 60 pounds of tungsten carefully machined to be the maximum possible size to fit in this package. Um, <laughs> and somebody sent it to me kind of, kind of as a joke, uh, which is very generous because it's quite a lot of tungsten. But this is actually a practical thing that, that so if you buy lead, um, lead is very dense. It's very cheap. And in fact, if you buy it shipped to you um, by, you know, the UPS or something, it costs more to ship it than the cost of the lead. Um, so almost all lead, if you buy small amounts of lead, it will come in a flat rate box. And they, if necessary, cut the ingots up or whatever to make them fit in the flat rate box. And so like, this is the thing people who sell lead, like for, you know, people who make their own fishing weights or their own bullets or something like that you need to buy bags of lead, they will always come in a flat rate box. And for some reason, the post office hasn't figured this out, or I guess there's just not that many people ordering lead, but it's great because it's a way to ship it where it's not unreasonably expensive. Anyway, back to graphite, so, or carbon. So this is, this is a piece of, uh, of also graphite that, um, and therefore pure carbon which it's got, it's engraved on there, lettering on there somewhere that is supposedly claimed to be, and I have no reason to doubt the authenticity, a chunk of what was called CP1, um, Chicago Pile 1, the first, um, the first nuclear reactor. I mean, the first time that a sustained, you know, self-sustaining uh, self nuclear chain reaction was created in a basement 
down somewhere in the uh, underneath the University of Chicago, which is possibly the stupidest possible place to experiment with creating a nuclear reaction, like underneath a major city. One might have done this out in the desert somewhere, but no. Um, but anyway, it worked and it didn't blow up the city. And when they disassembled it, they apparently cut it up into pieces. And I, I've seen there's, there's a number of these floating around. People have these graphite samples from that historic event. That's another piece of graphite. Um, I think, uh, so someone emailed me earlier asking about graphene and mm -hmm. I don't really have any graphene as such. I have some pyrolytic graphite um, that it used to be sitting on one of these cubicles floating perpetually on top of a couple of magnets because it will levitate over a strong magnet, which is kind of cool. Um, if you have a piece of it and you have, you arrange four very strong neodymium magnets in the right arrangement, you can actually put this little chip of, of um, pyrolytic graphite on it and it will just sit there a millimeter or two above the magnets forever. Um, unlike, you know, superconducting levitation where you have to keep it cold, this will just sit there at room temperature indefinitely floating above the surface. And it's because it's an it's extremely diamagnetic material, I guess, is that right? Um, so I have pieces of, of, but I don't know where they are because I think they fell on the ground and probably got vacuumed up and I'll have to get more pyrolytic graphite. And graphene, yeah, don't have any, probably should. Um, we have a couple other, we have a couple other questions. Someone from Facebook wants to know what makes a noble gas a noble gas? Ah, well, um, so the name comes from the idea that they don't mix with the riffraff, you know, their, their nobility, they keep to themselves, um, not associating with those commoners. Um, so this is, this is a little display here. It's got a, a high voltage transformer and it's just running an electric current through these different gases. And you notice, um, it's maybe a little bit hard to tell in the video, but in person you can see the, the neon one lights up much brighter than any of the other ones. Um, and that's why neon signs were a very common thing before LEDs kind of took over. Mm -hmm. um, because neon is a really excellent, I mean, all the, as you can see, all the noble gases, uh, they all glow with different colors, but neon is really the one that gives you the nicest color and the brightest. Um, so the origin of the name, um, you know, the fact that they don't, you know, they don't mix, they don't react with other, um, with other elements is a consequence of the, um, the fact that they have completely filled outer shells. If you look at the periodic table, that's the, the rightmost column. It's where, you know, electron shells are being built up one electron at a time as you go across the table. And when you get to the end of a row, the shell is complete. The element is happy and satisfied with its arrangement of elements. It's neither, you know, it doesn't have an excess one sitting. Um, well, there's no, uh, like here, the first column, the alkali metals, um, they have an extra element they'd like to get rid of. You go over here. Uh, the second to the last column, the halogens, um, they have a, a shell that is almost full. It's missing just one electron to make a full shell. So they would really like to find an electron to complete the shell. But the noble gas column, it's already complete. It's good. It doesn't need anything. Uh, it's happy by itself, not reacting with anybody. Except xenon, you can make compounds, but that's weird. Uh, and only recently discovered. Um, but so, you know, the fact that let's say chlorine is missing one electron and sodium, we'll move the water away from the sodium. Um, sodium has an extra electron. So you, you can imagine if you bring them together, um, you combine the sodium with the chlorine, uh, that extra electron in sodium will go and fill up the shell in chlorine. And now that leaves sodium with its outer shell being equivalent to neon, a complete shell, and the chlorine having a, a, an outer shell equivalent to argon, um, except the chlorine has negative charge and the neon has, or the sodium has a positive charge. Uh, and that's that, then they attract each other and you get a compound, which is called salt, table salt. So sodium plus chlorine, um, you get table salt. 
we waiting for somebody. Hmm? We've got a we've got a bunch of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, someone wants to know: Are there still elements out there that haven't been discovered yet? Well, so you may have noticed from 110 on has not been engraved with any names. Um, and that's because at the time that I built this table in 2002, roughly, I think it was, yeah, 2002, uh, this was the last element that had been named. Um, but since then, all the rest of these have been discovered and have been named. So, it, you know, it happened, I don't know, 110 and 112, I think, came next. I don't know, there's some, some order. Um, and it's all very, people argue a lot. It's the, the discovery of the elements is, you know, it's reasonably straightforward. You, you just need to build some gigantic particle collider and spend a, a billion dollars or so or whatever, and you can make these elements. Naming them is much harder because <laughs> coming up with a name for the element requires different groups working in different countries, including, you know, in the US, the, the Berkeley group and the, the Russian group in Dubna and the German group, uh, they all have to agree who actually discovered this thing first and therefore has the, the right to name it. Um, and, you know, who are you, who are you wh what name are you allowed to use? So for example, Seaborgium, this is a famous case because the, this album was named after Glenn Seaborg before he was dead. And that's like a big no-no. You don't name elements after living people um, but, but the Russian group agreed to allow the Berkeley group because Glenn, Glenn Seaborg was, you know, he discovered half the elements down here. He was, he was just very, very important person in the figure of, in the history of the discovery of transuranic elements. They really wanted to honor him with his own element while he was still alive. Berkeley group was absolutely convinced that they had discovered 105 first and so were the Russians. So they did a tr the horse trade where they basically, the Berkeley group agreed to not contest 105 being named after the Dubna Research Institute in Russia in exchange for the Dubna group not contesting the Seaborgium name. Uh, it took a long time to get that sorted out. And so that's, we ended up with these two. And there's people, I'm told, the people at Berkeley who still will not call this Dubnium because they know they found it first, but uh, the Russians have exactly the same opinion. Um, that they found it first. Anyway, so so these are all named, but but I um, I have neglected <laughs> to engrave them. I still have the machine. Actually, I could do it, um, and someday I probably will get around to actually engraving the rest of these to complete it. But at this point, everything up to one eighteen has been discovered, has been named. Um, no more arguments. Next question is: What about beyond? Although it wouldn't actually be here, it would be. What about I have to take a chainsaw and cut this table in half mm -hmm. and insert a new row? Um, and the answer is none of those, nothing past 118 has been discovered yet, but there's no fundamental reason why it couldn't be. There isn't a, a hard and fast rule that 118 is the last element. It's just that if there were any elements past 118, everyone would have to add a new row to the periodic table and nobody wants to do that because it would only have like one or two elements in it and it would waste a lot of paper and I'd have to saw my table in half. So I'm really hoping they don't find any, any more. <laughs> and if they do, I'm probably just gonna put a little asterisk somewhere, a footnote, which is probably what everyone else is gonna do. <laughs> um, because really it's just too much, too much to add a new row. Cause it's, I mean, like 120, 122, uh, the even number ones are a little more likely. There probably will be at some point, maybe one or two more elements. After that, you know, you do at some point run into some theoretical calculations that indicate they can't be stable. Anything past, um, anything past Californium, roughly, maybe Einsteinium. Basically, you know, from 100 on up, uh, the there, you know, we're talking about a few atoms at a time that have been made in um, particle accelerators and colliders and things. The half-lives are ridiculously short. They have absolutely no practical purpose whatsoever. There isn't even a whole lot of interesting scientific insight to be gained from making more of them. Um, pretty much the only reason that any of these subsequent elements were made 
at all was so that you could name it because it's just tremendously rare to be able to name an element. And I mean, it's, I mean, like the name is the most important part of the element. The actual element is of no interest to anybody. And after you've made two or three atoms of it, I think 113 was three atoms, I think was the, the total that have ever been made. And there's no point making any more because once you've secured the first one, you get to name it, you're done. Everything mm. interesting has been taken care of. Someone has a similar same. question of, so what does it mean to discover a new element now? Does it mean that you've managed to construct it as opposed to find it? Yes. Correctly? I mean, all, all the elements that, like everything you see here, they are all, you know, they're discovered, they're well characterized people. I mean, you know, some of these, you know, the, the proof that they've been discovered is a trace in a cloud chamber somewhere, some signal in an instrument that indicates there must at some point in the past have been an atom of this based on the signature of its decay products. Um, it's difficult to like measure the melting point of something that you've only made three atoms of, but you know, you can claim discovery without having done that. Uh, to discover a new element now, it is a question of making it. And you know, so that's what people are trying to make past 118 type elements uh, and they may succeed, but they're doing it by taking, uh, you know, I think somebody asked a question about um, element 112, and they, they were asking whether this was created by a firing zinc atoms into lead atoms. And I don't actually know for sure if that is how 112 was made, but if you add up uh, 82 protons in lead plus 30 protons in zinc, uh, you get 112 protons, and it's the proton count that determines the element. So actually, you know, firing zinc into lead, zinc atoms into lead atoms at the correct energy so that they fuse into each other, that would be a, you know, a very plausible way of making atoms of 112. So I wouldn't be surprised. I just, I don't know if, for sure if that's how it was done, but that would be a very plausible way of doing it. And that's how, what you generally do. You, if you want to make some of these elements, you pick two other elements whose atomic numbers add up to the one that you want. And then you try to shoot them into each other in just the right way, you have to like not to, you have to shoot them pretty fast because otherwise they won't fuse into each other, but not too fast or they'll just disintegrate as soon as they hit. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> right, go ahead. A lot of people also wanna know what's your favorite element? Ah, yes, well, the favorite element question. So uh, I, always, I always try to try to, play fair and say, well, you know, I have three children and I don't have a favorite child either. They're all very interesting and, and great people. Uh, and the same with elements, you know, every element has its, everything is interesting. Some, el all elements are, are good for something. So thulium is an example. I once had lunch with some people actually from a local uh, fine chemicals company here. And I'd recently been re reading a book um, that described thulium as the most useless element. And so, you know, I was having lunch with these guys and I discussed, oh, you know, thulium, the most useless element. And the guy literally stood up in outrage and said, what are you talking about? He just came back from, from, from either Russia or China with, you know, securing half the world's supply of thulium, um, which is like a few kilograms, uh, because it's, you know, crucial to his industry of high intensity discharge lighting because it has a spectral line in, in the green that you can't get anywhere else and you need thulium if you wanna make certain types of, you know, so like every element, there is somebody who will stand up, you know, outraged at the suggestion that it's not a useful element. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I have some really nice titanium things. Um, and I love titanium because it's very strong. It's, uh, it's you know, very useful. You can make good stuff out of it. Um, probably nothing interesting. Well, here's a titanium guitar pick. Um, and it doesn't rust. Uh, rust is, you know, the fact that iron rusts is so tragic. You know, iron is, there's just tremendous amounts of iron in the world. Iron ore everywhere. You can go on a beach and just run a magnet through the sand and it'll pick up iron ore. Um, there's all the iron you'd ever want. You can weld it. You can cast it. You can machine it. You can, you know, use different alloying elements to make a huge range of different properties. Iron is just a fantastically useful metal and it rusts. It just, it sits there destroying itself if you don't take care of it. 
And this costs like trillions of dollars a year in economic damage caused by the fact that iron rusts. Um, it's, it's just, it's so, so tragic. And titanium does not have that problem. Once you have something made out of titanium, you can keep it forever. You don't have to keep oiling it. It's not gonna go and rust on you. Um, and I'm looking now for, I'm looking for my titanium crowbars and not seeing them. That's interesting. Why do I not have my titanium crowbars? Um, I, have a, I have a giant titanium zombie bar, which is actually not in the book. I call it a zombie bar because it's, it's ideally designed for zombie attack because it's got like a big spike in case you need to you know, deal with the zombies and it's, I don't know, it's big and it's solid titanium. Uh, but I guess for now, I'll just show you this thing. So this is, let me maybe back up a bit so you can see it better. Um, so this is, it's pure titanium. Um, and it is the, if you're ever looking at a jet plane, like a passenger plane from the front and you see that the engines, there's like a gigantic fan. Uh, and this is a blade from, you know, the outside of like the first stage of fan blade as it's sucking air into the engine. Uh, and this is actually a small one. I mean, this thing is, you know, I don't know, almost four feet tall. And you imagine a complete circle of these things, it would be like eight or 10 feet tall. And that's a small passenger jet engine. They, they, you know, you usually only see them from a distance, so you don't realize just how huge they are. And they use titanium for these blades because it's very light and very strong. Um, but they only use them for the intake stages and the compression stages, because once you actually burn the fuel and then you have turbine blades in the exhaust path, titanium is not very strong when it's hot. And so you have to use um, different alloys. So this is, a, this is a blade from a Concorde engine post combustion, and it's a nickel iron, these so-called super alloys um, that are, they're much, much heavier than titanium, but they retain their strength at high temperature. So you have to pay the price of the weight to keep the, keep the strength up. Um, These for, are, oh, here, yeah, here's another one. This, this is another really nice titanium. This is a, it's called a blisk, a bladed impeller disc that is also from the compression stage of a, in this case, a very small jet engine. So we have um, not a whole lot of time left. So um, there's, one, uh, there's one or two last questions. Um, one of the first questions is we had a lot of people um, asking about bismuth. Could you, could you go over that for a hot minute? Well, funny you should ask. So <laughs> this is the bismuth crystal that is on my poster and is the main picture in the book. Um, these things are, they're lovely. They're completely artificial. I mean, it's bismuth is a, a gray metal but it happens to crystallize into this shape fairly easily. I mean, I've tried making my own bismuth crystals and I didn't get anything nearly this big, um, but, it's, but you can do it. I got a small crystal. Uh, you just basically take a pot of very high purity, like 99.999% pure bismuth and you melt it and you get it to just barely at the melting point and you stick a rod in, like you can see the bottom of this has kind of a flat spot. So you stick a rod in that's slightly colder and it starts crystallizing. And you have to do it very, very slowly without agitating the solution so it doesn't disrupt the crystal growth. And then these, these hopper crystals sort of square shape, it just forms naturally. And when if you guess just right, you can't see it because it's happening inside the molten metal. When you get just the right moment, you can pull one of these things out of the pot. And then the colors, this shimmering color, that's caused by um, an oxide film that's like a transparent oxide coating of varying thickness and the uh, interference between the different uh, frequencies of light, different colors of light, depending on the thickness of the oxide film gives you these different colors, called it sort of a dichroic effect. That was what it called it. And it changes based on the angle. These are also, by the way, titanium. Yet another reason I like titanium. These are titanium popsicles with, um, molybdenum popsicle sticks. And we have, we'll, we'll wrap it up with this one question, which is we have a lot of young people out here 
you know, maybe some of them have read your books. They're interested in all these elements. I mean, how, what are your words for our young, next generation that want to pursue chemistry or any sort of, uh, you know, career with the elements or in science? Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, chemistry is, in my opinion, should be the most interesting class in high school. Uh, I mean, chemistry is like where physics and math meets the world and you know things actually happen. Um, for some reason, I think the way that chemistry is taught is, is a little bit disappointing because there's an awful lot of emphasis on figures and calculations and, and stuff like that. Whereas to me, you know, th this is chemistry, right? These, these are elements, this, this is all real stuff. And you know, the fact that it can be arranged in this beautiful way in a table, it, you know, it's a beautiful intellectual accomplishment to have figured out you know, what are the fundamental laws of physics that organize elements like this shape is not at all arbitrary. This is all based on, you know, the, the, the sort of physics of the elements. And that's great. And one should learn that. And the atomic numbers are nice. And, you know, I don't really know most of them other than that I can't help but know because I've spent so much time with them. What's really interesting about elements is the individual personality of each one and the unique different things that each one is able to do. Like, you know, if you look at you know, vanadium and chrome, I immediately think of tools right, and bumpers like chrome. So chrome is shiny, right? That's what it's a lot of what it's used for is plating bumpers. Um, for every element, like I was telling you the story of thulium, right? Every element has something or, or often more than one thing that makes it a particularly uniquely interesting thing that gives you, you know, capabilities in, you know, creating materials using it or whatever. And I just find that, you know, the individual personalities of each element to be, you know, very interesting uh, and fascinating. And then, of course, you know, you start combining them with each other and you get molecules where you have just a fantastic diversity of, um, of um, properties and capabilities and such. And you combine them into particularly large and interesting molecules and you get life. You know, you get living things. Living things are, are just molecules and therefore elements arranged in a particularly clever way that, um, you know, causes element collections, whatever. I mean, the element collection is a result of elements working with each other uh, to, to decide to collect elements. Um, so I don't know, I, I, mean, I, I think it's a fascinating subject. I've obviously spent a lot of time, yeah, time on yeah. it and um, highly recommend chemistry as a subject to be interested in and, and, and don't let the way it's taught in high school discourage you because it's actually a fascinating subject. Absolutely. So thank you so much for being with us today and showing us your periodic table. We really appreciate it. Um, if folks want to learn more about your work or stay in touch, what are some ways that they can do that? Well, um, they can go to theodoregray.com, which I think you're going to put a link somewhere. Yeah. See if I can artistically arrange myself again. Um, so theodoregray.com, that will have links to um, my blog. And there's a way you can like sign up to be, get, get an email whenever I do a blog post, which is pretty infrequent. Like, uh, no, not, I don't do a whole lot of blog posts. Um, but if I do one, you would find out about it. Um, I guess I have a Facebook page. Actually, I have two Facebook pages. There's, there's Theodore Gray and there's Theodore Gray Public. Ignore the Theodore Gray public. Um, my publisher had me create that. It's some kind of like public figure Facebook page, but I don't understand it and I can't get rid of it. But <laughs> I never post anything on it. Just, just you know, look at the regular Theodore Gray, um, you know, username Theodore Gray with no extra adornments on it. That's the actual Facebook me. Um, and uh, you could, I mean, I have books. You can read my books. I think, uh, I mean, there's links for them. You can get them from Amazon or you know, whatever bookstore. Um, <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Uh, if you want a super cool um, periodic table face mask like that, it even has a uh, straw hole. So Whoa. you can open the Velcro there. So open that up. It's got a little hole there, so you can you can drink. And there's a little silicone plug that plugs it up. Uh, these. Um, so my girlfriend and I make these masks. Um, we have a maribelsmasks.com business, which to this day, we sold a whole lot of them last year, but even now people are buying these masks. I don't know why. 
seems like we're seems like people would have enough masks by now. Hey, but that still means we're wearing popular. masks and staying safe. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, theodoregray.com. Uh, well, first, periodictable.com, which is basically the complete collection. Uh, I mean, in my Elements book, there's something like 600 photographs, I think, in total. Um, at periodictable.com, there's something more like 2,500, um, uh, you know, including lots of things that are less interesting. Obviously, what's in the book are the most interesting things, but there's just a whole lot more of them. Um, so theodoregray.com, periodictable.com, and maribelsmasks.com. And then I suppose I should also evangelize mechanicalgifts.com. I wrote another book after I finished Reactions book um, called How Things Work, which is a book about mechanical devices. And as a sort of a companion to that, I have, I don't, I didn't think to actually bring one, but this is an example of a kit. So we sell um, acrylic, laser cut acrylic models of interesting mechanical devices. Um, that you build yourself and then they work. Like this is a radial engine and you can crank it and the pistons go in and out. And we have like locks and steam engines and all kinds of interesting mechanical devices that are covered in the book, uh, in the How Things Work book. So that's four websites, which I think you, you know, just go to theodoregray.com. It's got links to all of them. That's easier than. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll include um, links to the recording of this session, as well as uh, links to a lot of the things um, that we discussed this afternoon in a follow up email after this session. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to our audience. Thank you for tuning in and asking all your great questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of them. There were hundreds and hundreds of questions. So uh, thank you for your engagement. This wouldn't be possible without you. Um, if you want to see more of Teo, including his Bacon Lance, you can watch Beyond the Elements reactions on the Nova website or on the PBS video app. And while you're on Nova's site, you can find Beyond the Elements chemistry resources, like all three episodes of the series, our reactions interactive, and a collection of video resources on PBS Learning Media for educators. So um, make sure to follow Nova Education as well on Facebook and Twitter or sign up for our free educator newsletter to get updates on our next session. Um, thanks for joining us and have a great afternoon. Take care. Yeah, thanks for everybody. And thanks for coming to my office. It's more people I've ever had here before by like 10 times. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. Cool. Take care.